problems are doing what and how they are changing when a reaction occurs. Um, and obvious, and he has um, both some very unique equipment in his lab uh, for um, uh, X-ray spectroscopy, as well as access to state-of-the-art synchrotrons around the world. Uh, which is usually what you do when you need lots of flat screen situ experiments. So, uh, with that, are we not quite ready to go? <laughs> ready yeah, to go. I'm here on okay. time. Okay, <laughs> we're here on time. Great. Yeah. So, so, with that, let's give a hand. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for uh, the kind introduction. So, yeah, um, Wolfgang Pauli once said that if uh, God made the bulk, the devil must have made the surfaces, and uh, to paraphrase him. And so just to link what David just mentioned, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is how we can use X-ray photo emission to essentially get a gauge of how we can tune the electronic structure of components and also the interfaces they form. So I'm going to be talking about photoelectrochemistry, and I'm only going to mention actual photoelectrochemistry at the end to check that our predictions on how the charge should separate and behave because of how we've engineered the material in the interface to just check if we knew what we were doing and whether it worked out. Okay, so first thing we should note is CO2 emission levels do correlate with temperature. That is something which is scientifically known and this is data from NOAA and if we look at us, uh, transportation is the largest component of CO2 emissions by itself and um, we do produce a lot of CO2 emissions um, as part of our industry. And so when we're talking about CO2 emissions, we like to think in terms of renewable energies. And if you're thinking about renewable energies, we have to think in terms of energy storage. The best way of energy storing uh, is reservoirs, but we're not building any more reservoirs. Um, so portable energy storage is uh, usually invoked with batteries. And so I was very fortunate to spent the last fair part of the last decade working with Stan Willingham, who along with John Goodenough and Akira Yoshino uh, were awarded yesterday the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for Atomic Batteries, which is a big, big boost for uh, the uh, long-term goal of having people pronounce Binghamton without a P. <laughs> so the idea behind this is Stan Winningham at Axon uh, pioneered the development of basically this framework and it was John Goodenough and uh, Akira that were responsible for providing the kind of safer, more reliable, better performing uh, cathode and electrode. Uh, anode. And in that case, uh, the irony is that we are moving back to liquid metal which was the original idea, or original way in which Stan used. And uh, the goal to improve the cathode is still a long-going activity because essentially the capacity is limited by the, uh, the cathode in the sense of how much active material we have. There's a lot of inert component, electrochemically inert but critical components within the battery. And so increasing the capacity retention and increasing the amount of capacity we can get with the cathode is critical for improving the uh, performance of these portable devices for transportation, for instance. Um, the other thing is we have to remember that although we're using, a reno we're using something that is providing, uh, releasing that energy cleanly, the source of the energy that we've stored in it might not have been clean to begin with. And if we look at this, renewables have grown over, over the years, but they still account for, you know, the lesser of the other contributions. And so, um, sorry. the other alternative is fuel cells. Um, so batteries are essentially finite um, systems in the sense that you store your energy within this cell, whereas we have infinite uh, in the sense that we flow, as long as we can keep flowing gases, we're good. And the nice thing about this is we combine hydrogen and oxygen uh, to basically produce a waste product of water. Okay, so they have the same uh, ideas in the sense that we're spatially separating two half reactions and we're shuttling across uh, iron, in this case protons, in this case lithium, and instead of having intercalation, we have catalytic reactions. So these are quite promising and a lot of uh, DOE focuses towards more fuel cells for transportation. And one of the examples of this is actually ships. So, um, Around here we are 
we have very good access to NPR, um, always worth listening to. And I remember listening quite recently to uh, a story where they were talking about Sandia National Lab and Glowstone, which is a, a shipping company in uh, Sweden or Holland, I can't remember just there, uh, ac assessed the suitability of having hydrogen fuel cells for shipping. Um, and so this is an example, and these are the type of fuel cells, so it looks very similar to the uh, crates that we use for shipping. Um, and the benefits of this is, if we consider shipping just by itself, which is the main crux of our trade routes for getting goods and goods across the world, we rely on these big tankers that use these huge, dirty diesel engines, and they use the dirtiest oil they can buy, the cheapest. And um, in that case, alone, it counts for about 2.3% or close to 2.5% of all the world's CO2 emissions. So if we can eliminate this, this would be a big uh, stride. And so the idea is they are using these fuel, the idea is replacing these with the fuel cells. Now, I'm not a chemist by training. I'm more of a physicist. And physicists love symmetry. So the idea of using batteries for transportation is good. Using hydrogen fuel cells for shipping is great, but using the water as a source of hydrogen, well, that's awesome. So the waste product of your fuel cell is your source of your hydrogen. It's amazing, yeah? So with this project, um, I'm going to be tackling it from the point of view of a little bit different to how usually we talk about accelerated material programs. Usually with accelerated material programs, the, the idea is that we rely on the fact that computational chemistry has reached a point where we're pretty reliable. So we can use accelerated data algorithms combined with our computational chemistry to predict new materials and new solutions. Often the problem is a material problem. What I'm suggesting with our approach was we're kind of thinking a bit differently. And we want to do the reverse of this. We want to break these hydrogen bonds, uh, break these um, water molecules. And the way in which we're going to do it as I mentioned before, is we're going to try to treat this as a materials problem and use chemical intuition and graphic design <coughs> with some fancy tools to see if we can make better photocatalysts. Take something that wasn't a photocatalyst, make it into a photocatalyst, make it better, and then add actual co-catalysts to improve it. And I'm not going to get to the point where I'm, I'm almost going to get to the co-catalyst bit. But the main thing we want to do is take visible light, generate an exciton, split that exciton, transport it to at energies relevant to the redoxes at these two sites. Okay? So the key element in this is the exciton separation and the energy with respect to the redox levels. So that's the critical component that we'll be focusing on. And the best, and um, the one thing to note is you need a photocatalyst because water can be viewed as having a, ba a band gap material, a wide band gap material of 7 eV. That can <laughs> for a lot of applications. We actually use deionized water as a very good insulator. Um, and so the idea is that this, uh, we want to use visible light. So using a photocatalyst is critical for splitting water. So we talk about how we're facing an energy uh, crisis associated with our current reliance on renewable energies. Uh, current reliance on non-renewable energy sources. Um, and so there was, we can use history, there was the oil embargo in the 70s. And that prompted companies like Exxon and other oil, large petroleum companies to really invest in alternative sources of energy. And in fact, the work that Stan did at ExxonMobil was part of this. <laughs> and the reason he got a Nobel Prize is because they were worried about oil uh, distribution. And so one of the other ones was uh, Honda and Fushima in 1972 came up with a, a photolysis of water using the semiconductors. And so they split the two half reactions. You have your, uh, your water uh, oxidation um, here and your hydrogen evolution separated by two electrodes. And the idea is that the titanium dioxide was used to both absorb light um, and generate the charged carriers that were then separated for your two redox reactions, and they proposed that you should be able to do this without an overpotential with visible light. And the reason for the overpotential is because of this poor alignment here. So you wanted a stable metal oxide in your aqueous solution, 
But at the same time, the use of a stable metal oxide meant you had your valence band edge where your holes are generated uh, is uh, poorly offset with those redox potentials. So this has prompted a lot of people to view it as, can over the last, since then, the main focus is, can we shift it to the visible light regime? And so the idea is to go from this original idea of a wide band gap semiconductor and platinum to a case where now we consider using the interface to charge, separate carriers generated in these layers, uh, in these semiconductors, and then use those semiconductors either by themselves, bare or with a co-catalyst, like platinum, for instance, to uh, essentially uh, drive the photocatalysis. And of the two, this is the vexing problematic one. The reason why this one is the problem is because they're metal oxides. Okay, so metal oxides, if we consider our white TiO2, the idea is that you have these very strong, um, you're filling your oxygen to P states. They like to be nice and stable. They're deep compared to the vacuum level, which means they're deep compared to the normal hydrogen electrode, for a chemist. And the idea with this is we are basically wanting to oxidize oxygen. And so in this case, the way in we, so the idea is this energy difference means it unlikely to form holes to begin with, but once you do form them, because they're these non-bonding orbitals, they are very flat, and so let's demonstrate by schematically like that. The idea is that they're not very mobile. So we want them to form readily, and we want them to be mobile, and we want to be energies much higher. So the trick is to hybridize them with metal, um, metals. So then you're talking about your 3D transition metals where you play with the degree of hybridization, where you have D orbitals mixed with your P orbitals to drive up your valence band maximum. In the case, this can lead to some undesired properties. Um, you want it to be direct band gap. So it's not just the right band gap, you want it to be direct. The other thing is you might overshoot in the case of copper oxide. And the other thing is, you still might have, even in copper oxide, you can form holes, because you've reduced this energy difference to allow defect formation, but the <coughs> other issue is you still have D orbitals, which are pretty flat, and so you have poor mobility. So the trick is, how can we get around this? And one promising candidate is to combine a system where you've got a D naught, bit like your titanium dioxide, with a system where there is a lone pair active post-transition metal ion. And that facilitates a situation where you get kind of more of a Goldilocks regime where you have a direct band gap and you have S and P orbital uh, fixing here. And S orbitals are good for uh, more dispersive bands that translate into better mobility of your oxygen. And it gives you a way in which you can raise through the metal hybridization your ionization potential. So in this case, we're just interested in how we can use how uh, we can engineer the ionization potential. And this is very promising, these lone pair oxides. So, as I said, uh, not a chemist, but chemistry 101, uh, if we look at a water molecule, uh, we know that there's bond pairs and uh, uh, lone pairs. And the lone pairs are essentially ones that don't reflect bonding. And as a result, uh, they are, they take up more volume and you have a case where you have a distortion of your bond angles because of it. And so this is why uh, your bond angle is not as you would expect just from pure symmetry. The, what I'm going to be talking about is post-transition N minus 2. Um, so uh, in that case, if you're taking lead, but not using the more stable 4 plus, you're using the 2 plus ion, so less stable. So you tin and bismuth 3 plus instead of bismuth 5 plus. And in those cases, you still form a lone pair that, that leads to these structural uh, distortions. But the origin of the micro, uh, the way the description of these is slightly different because they do have to explicitly consider hybridization with the anion. So if we, so we knew from their structures like things like lead oxide, tin oxide, where they were in the lower oxidation state, we knew that they preferred these more distorted structures, signatures of lone pairs. And so in those cases, they knew that there must be lone pairs. That means there must be metal SP hybridization to form these lobes. Um, 
and that would mean that the S orbital must be close to the unoccupied P orbital. But when we started doing the computational chemistry, we started to say, well, in my calculations, my S orbital is below my oxygen 2 P's. How am I facilitating these lone pairs? The easy solution is just to say comput computational chemistry is wrong. This was like the 80s. You always get it back. <coughs> you always get it back. And by the 2000s, um, it was clear that that argument wasn't true. And the X-ray spectroscopy combined with density functional theory showed that you could get this hybrid, showed that the origin was this hybridization with the oxygen 2 P <coughs> orbital facilitated bonding and antibonding states. And these antibonding states were then hybridized. So this would be mixed S and uh, P orbital character mixing with the metal SP to form your lone pair state. So the key with this is we have this model of how we can play with these lone pair states. What can we do as a result? So if I take a system like 4 plus and 2 plus, the idea is that you can change the ionization potential by having a mixture of 2 plus and 4 plus. So to form tin 3, uh, there's a whole host of possible metastable phases in between these two by taking tin dioxide and cutting, planes, uh, uh, cutting oxygen uh, out in regular planes along the one one Um So this is, pr this is a, a candidate for that where the idea is you go from this oxygen-derived valence band edge and then you're introducing these lone pair states, the anti-bonding states and the associated with it, and so you can raise this up. In the case of tin monooxide, you go too far. You actually get a narrow band gap material. But the cool thing about tin monooxide is if you look at it, it actually looks transparent, reasonably, orange. And the reason for that is it has an indirect band gap. And so this small band gap uh, between the uh, band edges means that to a certain extent, it behaves like a narrow band gap semiconductor, which is quite good. It's a narrow band gap oxide semiconductor, which is good for uh, your uh, electronics. And meanwhile, optically, it does look transparent. And so you can actually try, drive this system so it's both the N type and P type, which is quite cool. Because then you can uh, make um, invisible metal oxide semiconductor. Uh, uh, transistors, or uh, so you could move towards invisible logic with this approach. But for the purposes of the water <coughs> splitting, it's not so great. This sort of band gap is more preferable, and this ability to kind of tune these uh, lone pair states in order to raise your valence band maximum or ionization potential in such a way that we could engineer, engineer good alignment with the redox potential, specifically the water oxidation. And so what I just want to mention is going forward, I'll be using X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And to continue the fill with uh, the Nobel Prize comments, X-ray spectroscopy, at the heart of it, the photoelectric effect was why Albert Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize. And then Kai Zygbar got a Nobel Prize for essentially the development of high resolution electron spectroscopy. And it's quite amusing in the field of ambient pressure photo emission and hard X-ray photo emission. You usually find that when you really dig into it, Carl Zygban already did that. <laughs> High pressure XPS, he did that. XPS on gases, he did that. So it's quite amusing when you look at uh, if you dig in close enough into it. And, and then the reason why I like to use the photo emission is because we can be a technique that's sensitive to comparing the computed uh, chemistry, the, the electronic structure, with our measurements. So this is essentially uh, work that I was lucky to be involved with with uh, Cornell, so um, um, that's just coming out, um, associated with being sensitive to the formation of those lone pair states. So this is going to be a technique for uh, studying whether we can engineer this ionization potential. So this is Cornell, and it's famous for the strain game. So the alternative is a topochemical game where we do temporal chemical synthesis. So um, the idea of a strain game is you get a large uh, degree, a large uh, playground for physics. In this case, it's a large playground for chemistry as well, in the sense that what we can do is we can, in collaborate, uh, my collaborator, um, Sabajit Banerjee at uh, Texas A&M, uh, has spent a lot of time working on vanadium oxide systems where uh, you can essentially uh, take a, a, a system um, leach out the ions, form metastable host compounds of different polymorphs, and then reinsert your desired 
um, iron into that polymorph. So it opens up a whole range of polymorphs, whole range of ions, because you can put things as light as lithium all the way down to lead. And this gives us a beautiful way in which we can modulate the electronic structure of our materials. And remember, this is the bit that we're most interested in, raising this up. So this gives us an opportunity where we could take advantage of determining <coughs> a system which has got a reasonably good band gap for our purposes to begin with and further improving on it by adding in our lone pair active <coughs> ions. So to give you an example of the benefits of playing with a polymorph, this was work we did before uh, we started uh, as part in tandem. The idea is like this is the most sta this is the more stable of the rhombic form of VTO5 where the vanadium 5 plus like pyramids form this nice uh, arrangement. And the idea is these are sites where you can put an iron in. Um, in that case, the structure, because of this, uh, the symmetry and the bonding, uh, essentially you get a split off state. So you get this lower, these um, unoccupied states from the vanadium 3DXY, I believe, uh, split off from the rest of the manifold. And so when you put a lithium into your system, it preferentially <coughs> fills this state. And by doing that, by doing that, what happens, it forms a polaron where you're going to have a situation where the charge is localized spatially and it disrupts the bond angles. This results in a case where if you try and put lithium into this, you're going to get a strong, heavy polaron, which is going to localize your electric charge. So if you want to move that ion, you have to adjust these bond lengths. And so you get sluggish kinetics, and this results in inhomogeneous lithium insertion. If you change the polymorph to this one, this scaffold uh, ladder and rung style uh, structure, which is metastable and only induced by the top chemical leaching, the idea here is that you lose that well-defined localized state. And that translates into a lower uh, barrier energy, for the, uh, the lower uh, polaron energy, and so relates into more hom homogeneous lithium insertion. So playing with polymorph does affect the electronic structure, and then we're going to go further by introducing um, uh, metal hybridization to play with this electronic structure. So around that time, we took one of the V205 Zeta form, which is essentially one of these uh, bronze-like structures uh, without the bronze. Um, and uh, these are sites where our ions can go. And so inserting lead 2 plus into this, confirming that we had the right character. What we found is we could change the electronic structure so then we could introduce the bonding and anti-bonding states associated with the lone pair mechanism. This would raise our ionization potential. We're able to confirm that from photonition and use different instant energies to uh, basically determine the orbital character of this state. And it resulted in a 0.8 EV shift up with the ionization potential. It's quite considerable. Um, and uh, so there's a beautiful demonstration that we can make this mechanism work and we could experimentally ver verify it. But we want to go further, so we viewed it as in this system, we could take advantage of our knowledge of uh, the uh, mechanism to then s rationally determine which would be the best polymorph and best ion to get the maximum ionization potential uh, reduction. And so in that case, what we're able to do is take advantage of the fact that you could either shift, you could shift to tallium, so you could go to tallium plus. That would give you more S orbital character, but it reduced the amount of splitting. So you get an improvement compared to lead, but you don't get as much of an improvement as if you shift to the five S orbitals, which already have more hybridization, and then go up. <laughs> and so in that case, you can get one and a half EV change of ionization potential. So in this case, your valence band is now getting quite close to the order oxidation potential. Because remember, our oxidation over potential for TO2, which, which was oxygen 2P derived, valence band was about 2 volts. Uh, uh, their v, our undug V205, similar-ish order of magnitude over potential would be required. And so you're talking about a 1.5 shift in ionization potential. That's really cool. So one of the things I, I wanted to mention was we tried to use, we tried to, so we had 
we were fortunate that we had a system where we could make a whole uh, playground of chemical compositions that we could look at. We could also take advantage of, we understand the mechanism, so we felt that density functional theory was reliable. So we could sift through. And we tried to show here that we chose a more rational approach in the sense that we were like, well, from chemical intuition and our understanding of this model, we can cherry pick which ones to look at. So we can get further there. The next thing is, and I, I try to mention this to people, I kind of view graphic design as an excellent research tool. Increasingly, uh, my generation and your generation of scientists are gonna have to increasingly do multidisciplinary studies. You will have to talk to uh, di people outside your discipline who use different techniques, different jargon, different thinking, different scales, and the idea is that you are supposed to be the expert and the generalist at the same time. <coughs> I find that when I was successful with trying to deliver on those type of projects, it usually was a case where I was able to meet with someone from the other discipline, and we both said, I don't know anything about what you do. And you don't know what I do. So we're not gonna use any jargon. <laughs> we're just gonna keep it nice and simple, okay? Working with a graphic designer is just like that. They're gonna say things like, what do you mean electron? <laughs> you can't rely on saying, well, it's delocalized because um, they're not gonna understand that. I gotta draw this. So the nice thing about working with a graphic designer is they ask the hard questions that you can usually avoid by invoking jargon. The next thing is you can work with the graphic designer with other uh, researchers, so we work with uh, Sabji Banerjee, who I mentioned, and David Watson of Buffalo, who is our, our, phys our, our, sort of our pho electrochemist, photochemist. Um, and the idea was that through discussion with the graphic designer, we could come up with a way in which how we could utilize this ionization potential control in a unique way. Um, how could we couple this with a light harvester differently to just plonking it with another semiconductor? Could we use something that's more efficient at generating, um, generating uh, carriers? And can we now use the interface and the engineering, interfacial engineering, to generate better charge separation at the energies we want? So I want to highlight this because it, can, it is a scientific process. And I've been working with him to develop a framework where we can educate. Um, so at Binghamton, we do offer a course called Materials Matter. That is a course where it's a lab requirement for non-science majors. We teach the origin of color and principles for detecting chemical uh, composition and um, properties, like why is uh, red ochre red, for instance. Um, we trick these non-majors into learning chemistry by not showing equations, but showing everything visually. visually. And we're fortunate we have excellent microscopy that can go down to sub <laughs> angstrom dimensions and we have calculations which are very precise and can give us the actual distribution of where the not just the bond distances but where the distribution of charge is a system so we're fortunate that we're trying to build up a framework and language so we're technically on the undergraduate level but on the graduate level it is a very good exercise it at the very least it helps you produce better quality table of contents graphics for your papers <laughs> <laughs> which <laughs> translates into better sites so the fortunate thing is it's always good to work with a graphic designer who has already got an interest in science and can help you with saying things, well, I've worked with uh, neuron systems, so I can help you with neuromorphics. Um, I work with plant systems, and so the idea is they can show the analogies of how plants separate their actions into how you could separate your components, bearing in mind you now have uh, a system where you can grow it as a nanowire and control the ionization potential and the band alignment with your quantum dot light harvesters. So then we could take a concept where we'd couple a light harvesting quantum dot. We would, um, so cadmium sulfate, oh, oh, yes, it's good. Um, couple it with a co catalyst. So then if we could transfer electrons this side, we could do the hydrogen redox this side. And then if we have a metal, uh, if we take one of our um, synthetic lone pair systems as a nanowire, we could then engineer good alignment to facilitate the charge separation and put it with a, another co catalyst in order to uh, redesign how we want to do the photo catalyst. And so, in that case, this is the spaghetti carbonari like pictures of the actual materials with the quantum dot detachments. And this is showing the kind of idea of how we would generate um, 
and s use the light harvester to separate the uh, charge and direct it at the right energies to our uh, spatially separated cocoons. So the approach is take that concept, take advantage of the fact that we've got this total chemical synthesis, engineer the right kind of electronic structure that should translate into the right sort of offsets that we want to facilitate that charge transfer, and then check if we were off. So that was kind of like the rational approach that we took. And so the trick with it is how can I measure these buried band alignments? So my choice du jour is photo emission. Um, and, but essentially it's a surface sensitive technique. The reason for that is because we're measuring the escaping photoelectron. So we have this attenuation of the So one trick is to strip away your layers. So you get more and more, you can get more information deeper by stripping away the top layers. But that's destructive. And if you're dealing with systems which have carefully controlled oxidation states, you blasting them with um, ions will modify that precisely controlled oxidation state. So the other approach is to increase the photon energy and go up the universal current. So the, the idea is you're giving, for the same, exa, for the same core hole um, binding energy, you are giving, transferring more kinetic energy and momentum such that you're giving this more chance to escape without losing its energy. And that does mean that you do gain quite a lot because you increase the, cur the, the attenuation profile. So you can go from a case where the lab-based XBS you have here, for instance, we'll give you uh, information within three to four nanometers. 95% uh, of your signal could then be within 40 to 50 nanometers with hack space. You're talking about thin film transistors. You're talking about stacks of 10 nanometers on 10 nanometers. These are meaningful dimensions. There's nothing new in the world. The best example of hack, the first example of hack space was actually Parasit Road, where this is Sphere, the old Stanford positron electron and accelerator, and they basically cut a hole with it, bolted on a chamber. This is the chamber inside, and they may or were able to measure beautiful uh, gold 4F signal where they could determine the lifetime of the um, 4F electrons. And um, the irony is in the, in the talk where Ingolf Lindau discussed this in 2017, he described this approach as easy photo emission. <laughs> <laughs> but the benefit of the way he was saying it was easy photo emission is not because you have to jerry-rig a system on top of your uh, friend's uh, uh, accelerator, but the idea is that you don't have to worry so much about the surface. Okay. But it took a long time before Hacksbase became a real thing. And the reason for that is because you are going to energies way above your absorption and edges, and so your cross-section plummets as a power law of five, minus five halves. So it plummets really quickly, and so you need brighter sources, and the first thing is you would need a, a, a synchrotron. And the second thing is, um, in terms of your resolving power, your resolving power depends on the, the energy you're at, and when you're interested in the Vegas band region, you're measuring at that topmost energy, because there'll be the binding energy will be near zero, and your kinetic energy will be mainly whatever light you put in. And so if you have a, a, a more traditional UPS system, a resolving power of the order of thousands, to do the equivalent energy, absolute energy resolution, you would have to have 100, 100 times more powerful spectrometers. So it's only in the advent of the early 2000s that we started having these spectrometers that could be bolted onto synchrotrons to do equivalent core level and valence band spectroscopy with Haxbiz that you could do in a lab-based system with XBS. And so that meant that I had to explain to my parents why I live in America, but often go to a place an hour's drive from their house <laughs> to actually do the measurement, which I say is critical for my career. So, um, and this is, um, uh, this is one of the students doing all the experiments. It's the same student. Um, and so, yeah, but fortunately, uh, we've recently had advances where we can use a liquid gallium jet source uh, and get comparable performance in the very, comparable performance is what is possible at some synchrotrons, others may be better. Um, but we can now have a situation where we use a liquid gallium uh, K alpha source and we can shift so then we can actually see 
uh, core level uh, silicon spectra uh, underneath 50 nanometers of silicon oxide. And so the increased ability to get information <coughs> deeper within means that we can distinguish things where there's pronounced differences between surface versus bulk, so we get a better indication of what the true interior of the material is. We can study non-destructive buried interfaces and determine band alignments. That's important for this project. But going forward, we would also be able to, because we don't disrupt that interface, and to quote another Nobel Prize winner, Herbert Kramer, the, the interface <coughs> is the device. So you don't want to compromise that, and because we don't need to compromise that, we can also run this with bias. So this system will be available for users, um, and it's only a short drive down the road. Be careful of deer. Um, and this system will have a two-color system because it will have both the soft and hard. It will also have a NERC vacuum transfer system, so you can put your precious systems in inert conditions all the way through. Um, so please note that we're um, expecting this to be run and operational from September next year. So what can we do with this? So, um, the idea is we can combine our computation and measure it. So we can, we can use a DFT to kind of look at our spectra and determine what sort of valence band offset we actually have. So in the case of just the bare V205 versus the Hax versus, uh, versus the cadmium selenide, which will be our light harvesting quantum dot, we actually have an offset where the, v, uh, the V205 the valence band is much below this point here. With cadmium selenide, um, you don't really want this so much because holes build up on this side because um, you've got a, a light and your electrons will transfer this way. Um, they'll get localized in a swirl band and that's good for the uh, photochemistry for the hydrogen involving, but you get a buildup of holes in this side. So you need to have sacrificial um, carriers to basically deal with the buildup of holes that lead to photoperation. So this direction of how the charge is separated is not good for our design. Although it does show how you can take two systems which are pretty poor and introduce better uh, hydrogen evolving behavior from that. In that case, the hydrogen is being evolved on the V205. So the idea is can we switch that around? So the idea is we take the dopants and we see how we're increasing the formation of those lone pair states and how they align. So in the case of lead V205, we get actually really nice. Uh, band alignment with cadmium selenide. But cadmium selenide is too low, is a larger size band gap. And um, we want something smaller so it would be more efficient with the solar spectrum. Um, so moving to cadmium selenide, we found that the tin V205 gave nice alignment. The other thing is by doping it with the tin we, and changing the polymorph, we remove that split off band and we partially fill these states because of the reduction. And that becomes quite important when we discuss how this can engineer photochemistry. So this is a diagram showing that we could have two different arrangements. We could either have the high, we could have the hydrogen involving on the nano rod, or we could have the hydrogen involving on the quantum dot. We want it on the quantum dot. So in the case of the V205, because the uh, valence band offset is so such like this, these photocarrier excitons, you get a situation where your electrons transfer here and you have a buildup of holes and you could, and you got, uh, we usually put a sacrificial agent in um, on that side. But on this side, you actually get the hydrogen involving component. As we change the polymorph, we move that split, uh, that split off band that seems to be important for localizing charge um, in order to facilitate the catalysis. Um, and so in that case, um, we see a reduction of hydrogen. And then when we switch to the lead and the tin, what we're doing is we're raising this state up, and so we get uh, catalysis occur on the other side now, where the hydrogen is now on the quantum dot. And although it may not be as high performance, the idea is we just wanted to demonstrate how we could switch the direction of the charges. Because we know we can improve on this. Because all we have to do is put platinum, decorate the quantum dots with platinum. And it does increase the performance. So then that's a case of how much how much do, how, do uh, the concentration, you know, the how is, if you can engineer better performance, is the idea. But unlike Beyonce, I want a platinum free future. So in that case, can we move away from platinum? Um, so one of the ideas is we could take advantage of polydisulfide <coughs> as a 
the if you've got corrugated molly die soft hard flakes, the corners are actually really efficient sites for um, hydrogen involving redox. And so the idea is you instead of decorating your quantum dots with platinum nanoparticles, you can decorate them with molly disulfide flakes instead. The trick is, can you continue having the kind of charge separation you want in order to facilitate that? So again, it becomes an interface issue. So with the interface, one of the things we found was the polarity is quite difficult to predict in the chemistry calculations. It became more useful to essentially ignore what the calculations of the interface was and just measure it. Um, because it gave us four correct answers. We didn't, so it gave us a solution, but it wasn't unique. We like unique solutions. So the idea was the photo emission gave us the unique solution, which was basically that we do get the offset such that the charge does transfer. Uh, so this is a case where we only consider the binary system um, at this stage. Uh, and we were able to show that we do get electron transfer from the quantum dots to the molecular sulfide. And that we can introduce for the chemistry on this side, uh, which was absent before. Um, and the idea is now to construct the whole ternary system to then see how that performs. So at that point, oh, oh, um, yeah, there's time for questions. Um, what I wanted to do is just emphasize how with accelerated profiles, it, it, the advances in DFT, density functional theory, have led to the point where you can do uh, a material uh, screening process, and a lot of my colleagues and friends do do that. The approach I wanted just to emphasize to you guys is that you can sometimes do things differently. And the value of graphic design, not just improving the table of contents graphic and making your papers more readable, but the other thing is you can actually use this as a way to discuss, um, identify the problem across the, the big picture problem and how your contributions can contribute in the bigger picture between colleagues when you're doing a multidisciplinary project. Um, the other thing is um, high throughput synthesis plus DF, high throughput DFT is fantastic. Um, but I would say that you do, that doesn't mean you can do it blindly. Um, you should have, fund understanding the fundamentals is crucial because then you can take advantage of that fundamental knowledge to come up with ideas of how you can turn a dot. And then finally, buried interfaces are, if <laughs> I can imagine uh, the devil Twitter basically pulling in and saying, well, if you thought surfaces were bad, consider buried, sur buried surfaces. <laughs> so I usually show the Twitter feed with that. But essentially, uh, in this area, I, I, I'm advocating that this is one approach where you can look at those buried interfaces and get information that complements things like stem cells. Uh, and, and, and can provide information that is directly uh, comparable with the density functional theory calculations and simulations. And then finally, this does allow you to engineer a new solution where you can change the paradigm and move things from one side to the other and basically come up with new ways in which you can solve old problems. So with that, thank you for your, t oh, finally, should thank the people that are really made the difference. So. Um, I've mentioned uh, Savage Banerjee, David Watson, and um, Gokhan Asen. Um, we worked together on a DMRF proposal um, to accelerate materials design. And I should acknowledge the students in my group that did all the work. So uh, Linda, who's now at PNNL, and uh, Sarah Mohammed. And with that, thank you for your attention. questions and I want to encourage students to ask questions and they get to ask before the faculty do. <laughs> I guess when you're doing research, I noticed a lot of you talk about it, so how you're trying to get rid of platinum. Yeah. But um, when you're looking at other um, like solutions that are platinum free, are you also looking at like their relative like distributions on Earth? Because I feel like I don't know that uh, molybdenum is like a very yeah. common element. So the question is, comes back to, you do listen to a lot of talks where they talk about, here's the Earth's crust, this is how much abundance we've got, how we get, this is why we should, everything should be like silicon, yeah, or oxygen, there we go. Um, I would argue that Kodak was making all the film for years, for decades, yeah? Silver was a critical component of that, silver's precious, it's a commodity, it's really, it's, it, 
it, in addition to being scarce, it's also expensive from a commodity point of view. They owed 50% of all the silver. If the solution works, we usually find a way of dealing with the issue with the lack of material. So the solution should not just blinker in such a way that we say we only consider non-earth abundant, uh, only consider earth abundant systems. The reason why we want to move to platinum free is sometimes you have constraints where a funding agency says, we're not funding anything with platinum. <laughs> so that's the other reality. So I do agree with you. I think you should find the solution first. What works best? You need to understand the fundamentals to determine why it's working best. So if platinum is the solution, we can approach it as that might be what we have to use. Or can we take advantage of using some of those components to synthesize something similar? Um, but yeah, we shouldn't blind ourselves to just um, earth abundant solutions. Maybe one of the students or pinch me, but I think we have two faculty questions. Daryl was first. Okay. I want to ask about stability. So you've, you've outlined a very elegant solution, but what happens when you put this into the solution in terms of the, like the, the, the yeah. stability of these things versus time? Uh, that's a very good question, and it links back to the general question, which is can we watch everything operando? And so one of these things is, what I've demonstrated here is exit. We basically said, if we move these parts, how does it, can we interpret how we're seeing the device work? Obviously, we want to do these sort of techniques while the device is run. So one of the approaches we've been doing is not photo mesh. We've been developing, working with the ALS with soft x-ray absorption to make a wet cell. And so in that case, um, you could run the catalysis and see how things are evolving. And the larger probing depth would have allow us to jerry-rig some of those electrochemical uh, in situ cells to our purposes. Um, because we basically paste the um, basically pasting the, the, the Photo cathode, uh, the photo electrode onto a silicon nitrate window, and with the probing depth, you should be able to access that in the same way as they do with a fraction of absorption. So, yes, we are doing study to see that because there should be extra modifications associated with that interaction um, that we're not seeing when we're looking just at the exit. Well, well, how about data that you have today? How does it just look when you plunge it in the beaker and look at it over time? That's a good question. Um, generally, I try not to touch anything wet. <laughs> <laughs> I've left that to my uh, collaborators. Um, but yeah, no, the stability is a, a really big issue because one of the ones we were trying to advertise with the, um, the tin D205 is this work. When we were showing the tin D205, how we could engineer better performance, this log scale, better performance with the with lead, was essentially the argument that we could get around the photo corrosion of the quantum dot. And so I was like, this is great. And they're like, yeah, we just have to wait about two years to really prove that with our experiment because you need to have those longevity tests. And like that. But the initial results suggested that it wasn't breaking down so soon as you usually see, so that would be promising. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Thanks. So do we have uh, any student questions? You may yeah. not like my questions. No. Okay. <laughs> so to start with, uh, the premise of trying to have hydrogen via renewable energy is a good one. That yep. was the sort of beginning of the talk. But I'm having trouble understanding what the ultimate metric might be of performance. Since we can we can do electrolysis, we can combine the thermochemically, yeah. uh, there are lots of ways to do this with, which use renewable energy. So that has a pretty high performance right now and getting better. Hmm. So what's your final objective with this when, with uh, respect to these materials? So, this, so the question is like, why the metrics that would be kind of success for this approach. And I think some of the me benchmarks that the funding agencies are saying are sort of, can we get to uh, equivalent of uh, $4 gas, ga uh, gas mm -hmm. gallon? Let's just start with the overall efficiency of taking the light in, yep. converting it to electricity or photocatalysis to get it to hydrogen. Yep. I know what that efficiency is now for a high temperature electrolysis with a renewable yep. system that's pulling it out. Oh yeah, so the electrolysis. You know, multi-junction uh, photovoltaic cell. So that's no, right? So yeah. So I would say, in answer to your question, the electrolysis is the way in which, of these, gas steam reforming is the one that dominates with terms of 
to do some well. Right? Well, well, one of natural them gas before me is a fossil fuel. We yeah. don't want to do it that way. We don't want to do it that way. But <laughs> of this approach, the electrolysis produces way more hydrogen commercially than this okay. approach. This is a still like TRL level right. zero or one. Yeah. From my perspective, what I'm interested in is basically playing with the mechanism of Right. The this is not a criticism of the elegant yeah. material science and the technique. Oh, I totally it's agree. where are we headed as engineers, ultimately. Yeah. A so lot of us are in this room. I right? think the main things I would take away from this is not necessarily how it impacts that specific solving that problem. What I liked was how we could use the lone pair mechanism to modulate things. So right. the actual, that underlying thing helps with things like uh, developing so one of the things we did was like, what do we mean by lone pairs in an amorphous system? So we made amorphous thing. So that that aspect, I agree with you. This is not going to save the world. And if I suggested that, <laughs> it's just fun. <laughs> but the, the the technique for measuring the varied interfaces, I think that's I think that is worthwhile because I agree. yeah. Thank you. Are there any student questions? You guys have been pretty quiet today. There'll be an exam after. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, so the next thing we've got is the lunch with the with the. Oh, the, the nice.